start? Sure. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our final webinar, Outdoor Air Monitoring in the Willowbrook Community. My name is Holly Wilson. I'm with the Office of Air Quality Planning and Standards. And this will be an hour that we've slated an hour for this webinar, including Q&A. There are two ways to listen um, to this webinar through your audio. You may listen by dialing the phone number 1-866-299-3188, um, conference code 9 541 um, Or you may listen through your speakers on your computers. We're asking you to either choose to listen via your phone or your speakers. Um, if you choose to listen through the phone, please mute your speakers on your computer so that we don't get any feedback. Okay. Um, so to see the screen, full screen, there are four arrows pointing in opposite directions. If you click on that, you will get your... Um, the full screen. If you want to go back and minimize it to this view, just hit escape and it'll take you back to um, this view and it'll leave you with your Q&A um, option. We will only take questions through the Q&A box, so um, feel free to begin typing your questions at any time. We will try to answer as many questions as we can at the um, web, um, webinar. If you are having any problems with um, functionality, um, you may want to just log out and log back in. If you're getting feedback or having other problems, you can just communicate to us through the Q&A chat box, and we'll check, make sure that there are no technical difficulties. This webinar will be uploaded to um, the website where um, all of the other webinars are, and here is your URL where you can find the materials and the slides from this um, webinar. Um, like I said, if the slides are difficult to read, you may want to go full size. If you're having technical difficulties and you've already logged in, logged back out, and you've checked your volume, just send us a note um, through the chat box and we will um, do our best to remedy the situation. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to our presenter, um, Mike Kerber our office, um, Deputy Office Director um, with OEQPS, and Mike Way. Thank you, Holly. So we're here today to talk about the 11 days of air monitoring data from the month of March. Um, Holly said this was the last webinar. Um, it, it is for now. Um, we did pause monitoring at the end of March. At that time, we said that we were evaluating our options, including whether to resume monitoring if conditions in the community change. So at least for now, this, this is the last webinar. Uh, before I start talking about the 11 days of sampling, I just wanted to highlight a couple of things. First, I wanted to note three important dates uh, for our program. Um, we started sampling on November 13th, 2018. We ended sampling, at least temporarily, on March 31st. So over that 20-week period, we collected a total of 49 days of monitoring. The other date I wanted to note is February 15th, when Illinois issued a seal order for the stereogenics facility. Looking at the 49 days, we have 32 days of sampling before February 15th, 17 days afterwards. Mm -hmm. So obviously the 11 days we're going to talk about today are a subset of those 17 days. We've reported on six of those days from the middle to the end of February on our last webinar. But we will provide some summaries of what the situation looked like before the seal order and after the seal order, looking at those 32 days before and the 17 days afterwards. Really, the main takeaway, if you, if you look at all of the data, the 17 days since February 15th, and this is certainly true for the 11 days in March, the measured concentrations are much lower 
after the seal order, after February 15th, as much as 95% at some locations. And we'll get into to more detail about this in, in just a minute. So we can go to our next slide, the map of the monitoring locations, the eight locations. We have the two sites that are close in to the two purple boxes with X's. The two purple boxes with, X, with X's are the two sterilization buildings in Willowbrook. And then the two max concentration sites are the two that were cited to measure, obviously, the, the maximum concentrations that we expected in the area. The six other locations were identified by some of our analysts here, as well as input from the community. So the, the six surrounding sites have provided useful information throughout. The next slide shows the sampling schedule. We've generally followed a one and three day sampling schedule throughout. We've made a few adjustments along the way because of holidays, because of weather conditions, et cetera. Um, and certainly if you look at the month of March, we were consistently following the one and three day sampling schedule. We've talked a lot about wind roses um, over our, so the several webinars that we've held. Um, here we have two wind roses. Um, on the left, you see the wind pattern over the entire 20 week period. And on the right, the wind pattern for the sampling days, the 49 sampling days during the, the 20 week period. And recall that the spokes represent the direction from which the wind is coming and the colors represent the wind speed, hotter colors representing higher wind speeds. So as you can see, the two wind roses are pretty consistent, um, which suggests that the meteorological conditions, at least the wind conditions, on the 49 sampling days were pretty representative of the overall conditions throughout the entire 20-week period. So let's talk about ETO concentrations. Um, first slide represents the 20-week average for the entire data set at each of the eight locations. And the pattern that we see here that we've reported on previously is, number one, the highest concentrations are at those two close insights at the Village Hall and the Willowbrook Warehouse. And secondly, the concentrations fall off as you move away from the two purple X's. What this suggests to us, the spatial pattern, is that the two sterilization facilities are responsible for a significant amount of ethylene oxide in the area. So again, this represents the 20-week average, the 32 days before the seal order when the facility was operating, as well as the 17 days after the seal order when the facility was shut down. So let's break the data into those two parts. The next slide here shows those before and after, if you will, concentrations. So the number on the left represents the, thir the average for the 32 days prior to February 15th. And the number to the right of the slash represents the average for the 17 days following issuance of the seal order after February 15th. As I indicated earlier, at some of the locations, the change, the decrease, and measured concentration was as much as 95% at some locations. If you look at the numbers to the right in each of the little boxes there, the post seal order averages, they're generally on the order of 0.12 to 0.16 micrograms per cubic meter. And if you average across all the sites, you get a number pretty close to 0.15 micrograms per cubic meter. So we're going to talk about each of the 11 days, and we're going to go through them rather quickly because they're fairly consistent. What you're going to see is that the range of concentrations is generally on the order of 0.1 to 0.2 micrograms per cubic meter. Sometimes we have numbers a little bit lower, sometimes a little bit higher. But the numbers are very consistent. 
there's little variation from day to day, despite, as you'll see, some significant differences in wind direction. So starting with March 1st, this was a Friday. The wind rose in the upper right-hand corner shows that the winds were out of the east, northeast. There was some variability because there were some other wind directions over this 24-hour period. And the concentrations ranged across the eight site network from non-detects at three locations to about 0.14 at four locations. Moving on to March 4th, you'll notice that the wind rose changed significantly, so now it's blowing out of a completely different direction, almost 180 degrees difference. March 4th was a Monday, winds were primarily out of the west-southwest, and concentrations ranged from non-detects at three locations to 0.16, that maximum occurring at the Village Hall. So again, despite completely different wind directions, the concentration patterns were very consistent with the prior sampling day of March 1st. Moving to March 7th, wind direct directions are quite different once again. Nevertheless, the concentration range was pretty similar. We have non-detects at two locations and a maxo maximum concentration of 0.16 at the water tower site. March 10th, wind directions changed once again, this time out of the west-southwest. Concentrations ranged from about 0.07 to a peak value of 0.24 at Willow Pond. March 13th, again, a pretty significant change in wind direction, this time out of the south southeast. Concentrations range from about 0.14 to a peak value of about 0.39 at Gower Elementary. So we're seeing over just these handful of days so far, big changes in wind direction, but pretty similar ranges of concentrations. March 16th. This was actually the highest day. It was a Saturday, the highest day in March, with a 0.46 at the Village Hall, a 0.32 at Willow Pond. Winds, as you can see, were primarily out of the west. Moving to March 19th, winds out of the south, southwest. Concentrations range from about 0.05 to 0.21, again, with the peak occurring at Tower Elementary. March 22nd, winds out of the northeast, concentrations ranging from 0.06 to 0.22. March 25th, Winds out of the north, northeast, concentrations ranging from 0.07 to 0.18. March 28th, winds out of the north, northeast, concentrations ranging from 0.09 to 0.23. And finally, March, 23rd, March 31st, we have some hours with winds out of the northwest, fair number of hours with winds out of the south, southwest, concentrations ranging from non-detects at one location to 0.24. So I went through that pretty quickly. There really wasn't a lot of variation, except for wind direction, on those 11 days, but the concentration patterns, as I indicated, were fairly consistent across the eight site network in terms of the magnitude of the values. So I wanted to wrap up with a couple of things. One is I had just a few summary slides, and then I want to talk a little bit about next steps. So this slide just provides a few numbers on the sampling program. November 31st through March 31st, 20 weeks, 
49 sampling bays. Data capture over the period was excellent. 97% of the samples were returned as being valid. So very good data capture for the sampling period. And, and just some very simple averages looking at the two MAC sites and the six other residential sites. We provide here the pre-seal order averages and the post-seal order averages. So as expected and, and as we've reported, the highest concentrations at the two MAC sites decreased significantly between the pre- and the post-seal order periods. There was also a significant decrease at the residential sites, and that post-seal order concentrations were pretty consistent, averaging on the order of about 0.15 micrograms per cubic meter. So these are just the numbers for the two MAC sites and the six residential sites combined. The next slide breaks those apart and shows you the pre-seal order and the post-seal order averages. Again, 32 days for the pre-seal order averages, 17 days for the post-seal order averages. Spatial pattern is pretty clear. That pre-seal order, the, the Village Hall and the Willowbrook Warehouse site had the highest concentrations and that there was a substantial pre and post difference in the average concentration values. But I think there's one other important takeaway on the last slide, and that is the day-to-day -day variation in concentrations. These are the averages, but if you look at the individual 24-hour samples, you see a lot of variability across the network. And the different colors represent the different sites. And you can see based on wind direction, based on meteorology, based on perhaps operating conditions at the facility, prior to February 15th, there was a pretty wide range in measured 24-hour concentrations. That all changed, obviously, post-seal order. So the spatial pattern is pretty apparent in the data, but the temporal pattern is also worth noting. So I wanted to close just talking about some of our next steps. The, the monitoring data was intended to help inform the risk assessment, and that work is well underway. The risk assessment will be based on mathematical computer modeling. The monitoring data will help inform the computer modeling, will help inform the risk assessment, but it's emissions inventories and it's meteorology that will pri primarily drive the risk assessment. And it will provide a more comprehensive analysis, both spatially and temporally, than what we were able to capture with the monitoring network. network. We'll be able to look at more locations. We'll be able to look at more meteorological conditions than what we were able to look at in our eight, compared to our 8-week or 20-week sampling period. The risk assessment is generally prospective in nature. It will be forward-looking. And it will be the type of rigorous assessment that we do for regulatory purposes at EPA. Another next step is the public meeting, which many of you are aware is currently scheduled for May 29th. And we will be presenting our risk assessment. We'll be summarizing the monitoring network and the monitoring data that we've collected. And we've invited Illinois EPA, Illinois Department of Public Health, and ATSCR to talk about some of the work that they're doing. And of course, there will be an opportunity for questions and answers. And then the other significant next step is our national rulemaking, our EPA rulemaking. We have two rules that are currently, that we are currently working on. One is for commercial sterilizers, such as the sterogenics facility. We are required under the Clean Air Act to conduct a technology review every eight years. And that is, that review is the one that is currently underway. The other rule that we have under review is the miscellaneous organic NESHAP, National Emission Standard for Hazardous Air Pollutant. We refer to that as the MON, M-O-N, miscellaneous organic NESHAP. And we are required by the Clean Air Act to conduct a technology as well as a risk review 
for that particular rule. Both of those reviews are underway. We expect to issue proposals this summer, and there will be opportunity for public comment following the issuance of those proposals. And as some of you are aware, a couple days ago we held a webinar on, on public participation and talked about the opportunity for holding a public hearing as well as how to participate during the public comment period. So as we get closer to issuing those proposals, we will certainly notify people of their publication and begin that public participation process related to those two rules. So Laura, with that, I think we'll close and open up for questions. Okay, one, just one other um, next step that, that uh, we wanted to, to remind people of. We are going to be doing um, a webinar on doing risk assessments, how we do our risk assessments. Um, that's not scheduled yet, but we will do that before the public meeting so that at least you'll have some background on how we've gone through this process um, before you actually see the final results. Um, so with that, um, we're going to take some the, the, the questions. Um, the first one is, what does EPA know um, now about the sources of ethylene oxide uh, detected since sterogenics is shut down? Well, we do know because we are measuring concentrations above detection level on the order on the average of 0.15, 0.15 micrograms per cubic meter that there are other sources of ethylene oxide. And we are pursuing, as we've talked about in the past, primarily a measurement-based approach to try to understand what those other sources are. So we're further analyzing these data. Uh, we're trying to look at monitoring data collected in other areas to identify what those sources are. We've also started to look at emissions inventories, but I think it's the monitoring data and the measurements that have been collected that will be collected that will better inform that. At this point in time, we really don't know what the other sources are. Um, we don't have a timeline for that investigation, but it is ongoing, and when we have more to report, we will certainly be back and talk about that. And uh, the next question is, please explain how sample one and sample two data from the village hall and warehouse were used to calculate the overall averages. From the figure shown, it appears only one, only sample one data were used. Please describe the relationship between sample one and two, and if they were duplicates, why not average the values? Thank you, Laura. And this is Lou Weinstock. I worked with our Region 5 partners to plan and implement the study. Uh, and uh, the, the questioner has a, a good issue. Uh, he's correct, or he or she is correct, that the averages we see are sample one and sample two. The, the, the quickest answer as to why we didn't average them is that in our quality assurance project plan, which we followed very, very closely, there was no provision or plan to average them. So it was important for us, obviously, to follow the QAP you know, to the letter. The reason that we don't do that, though, is that sample value is validated distinctly. When you average them, you lose the connection to the validity of each sample, and sometimes down the road in the study, it can lead to some confusion. But certainly, we could have done that. Uh, looking at the co-located numbers, it would not have made more than 0.1 microgram difference in the longer-term averages for village hall or for warehouses. So the, the averages that Mike mentioned were, would have been virtually the same had we averaged the co-located samples in. And again, the reason we do that is to analyze or characterize what we call precision, how repeatable the results are. So we, you know, they're independent cans. They're hung right next to each other and picked up at the same time. You know, all types of sampling methods have a bit of imprecision. Those one versus two samples for the warehouse and for village hall allow us mathematically to calculate that imprecision. And that actually helps us get an idea about the background value and how accurate it is. You know, so I know that was a long answer, but it's an important concept. I'm glad it was brought up. Okay, and the next question, where can I get the schedule for risk the risk assessment webinar when it's scheduled? Um, so if you are not already on our mailing list, send me an email. That's McKelvey, M-C-K-E-L-V, like Victor, E-Y, 
dot Laura, L-A-U-R-A, at epa.gov, and I will add you to our mailing list, and as soon as we have that scheduled, I will get that out to folks. All right, let's give it a couple more breaths. Yep, we got another question. Okay, so the next question is, the data show no gradient around Interstate 55. Does that mean automotive exhaust is not necessarily a source of ETO? We haven't ruled out anything at, at this point. Um, as I said, we're primarily taking a measurement-based approach. So we want to look at monitoring these monitoring data closer. We want to look at data from other locations around the country. Um, so certainly looking at near roadway locations may be important. Um, but right now we haven't ruled out anything. Okay, and then the next question is follow, uh, uh, follow up on the sample one, sample two. Why are sample two data not included in the presentation? Well, we did have those for each of the individual days. Um, and maybe, I'm sorry if I didn't point that out as I went through the individual days. Um, Ooh, yeah, pull, any day, pull up a day, any day. There you go. What day is it? That is... 25th? Uh, 25th. 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 Okay. If you look at the Willowbrook Village Hall location, um, there's two readings there. Um, the first value is the primary sample. The second one is the co-located sample. Okay. I don't see any more questions. Um, well, while we're waiting for other questions, I want to really thank all the partners that, that helped us collect this information. Uh, we wouldn't be able to get up here and present it and show you some of our assessment and analysis of the information if a lot of people hadn't worked really hard to help us collect the data. So the Region 5, EPA Region 5 staff who were in the field every day during some very cold and snowy days this past winter, um, they did a lot of the heavy lifting. but the people in the area, um, the village of Willowbrook, Tim Halleck in particular, um, was really critical uh, both in terms of us providing access to locations, uh, collecting additional sampling. Um, so I, I want to thank Tim for all of his hard work um, and all the assistance that, that he provided and uh, the, the, the help was, was really incredible, so thank you, Tim. Um, and the school districts as well. Uh, Dr. Simon was very helpful, both from the standpoint of providing access um, as well as uh, participation throughout. So the, the assistance that we got from the community in many ways was uh, a necessary step in order for us to get to this point. So thank you all very much. Okay, um, so we've got a follow-up again. Uh, you know, the, it seems like the sample two uh, were not included in the summary. So, uh, do you, Lou, do you mind addressing that? Sure, a absolutely. Uh, there is a separate document, a table or spreadsheet that's posted on the website that has the complete data set. Uh, the first four columns are actually Village Hall 1, Village Hall 2, Warehouse 1, and Warehouse 2. So, those data are, are completely available. Uh, we did not include the data in the last chart that Mike showed, that a kind of new trend analysis. Uh, the, the only reason for that really is that you'd be, it would be confusing. The chart would be double counting values, in, in essence, from the two close insights. It, it might be not as clear probably as the way we did it. So anyway, it, that's just an observation. The data themselves are, you know, transparently included on that table that was posted last night, along with the slides that Mike worked through. Okay, next question. Do you currently have any data or studies that indicate automotive uh, uh, ex exhaust is a source of ETO? Yeah, as I said before, our investigation of other sources of ethylene oxide is ongoing. Uh, we haven't ruled out anything at this point. Um, we, we don't have a lot of emissions measurements. Right now we're trying to work off the ambient data that's been collected here and in other parts of the country to try to identify what those sources are. All right, not seeing any other questions. 
um, we're going to wrap it up for today. Stay tuned for the time and date for the risk assessment webinars. And if you have follow-up issues, um, you're, you feel free to contact me, Laura McKelvey, again at McKelvey, M-C-K-E-L-V, like Victor, E-Y, dot Laura, L-A-U-R-A, at EPA.gov. Thank you. Have a great weekend, and enjoy your Friday night. Bye. The leader has disconnected. The conference will be terminated in five minutes.